All right, this is Todd Atkins, and I'm back with Miguel Adorati, and we're going to do a little different episode tonight. And uh, before we start, I'm going to talk about our sponsor, Live to Fight Design. I do this before every episode, but you can see them at uh, Live to Fight Design on uh, Instagram. And if you use my promo code, Todd Atkins, you can get $20 off your order, fight banners, gym banners, things like that. Now, I want to credit a guy, MMAI, who made a video um, how did the UFC get so political? But it really focused on the subject of like MMA managers and UFC managers to be specific, guys who kind of do the UFC's bidding. And, you know, Miguel worked for a number of promotions. He's been involved in the sport off and on since, you know, the 90s. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this video because I had Miguel watch it. And uh, yeah, Miguel, I kind of want you to just take it away. Well, uh, yeah, my hat's off to MMA. I mean, you know, they're definitely um, kind of taking an independent approach to UFC and, you know, MMA uh, journalism. And uh, my hat's off to that. There's not enough of that. So they, they did a good job. Um, yeah, I've, I've noticed a lot of the problems that they were pointing out in the video. You know, it does. It, it, and the reason I thought we could converse about it is that. You know, I was looking on the internet and the UFC uh, fighter class action lawsuit website is still out there, you know, and that lawsuit is still progressing. They, you know, now that we're into like a billion dollar lawsuit and, uh, you know, things will move glacially here. But I think that this management situation, if you really want to examine it and look at some of the ideas that could be that were brought up in that video and find out if that's going on, you know, like, is there, you know, certain managers that get their guys into the UFC with little or no protocol. And then other people are sort of blackballed and things that are, is the management fear of the people that are on the UFC fight pass and that tie in, are they sort of, you know, keeping a monopoly type of um, reaching and, and control over guys. And, you know, when you go back to the old days, there's a very, you know, a little bit of UFC lore here for the people. There's a story where, and, and we talked about in, in with Todd in the podcast where we covered Joe Silva's history. Joe Silva was the key transitional person from the SEG days to Zufa. He was the only person that was there before and after at the highest level. Everybody above him, Bob Meyerowitz, Joe, uh, Art Davey, you know, John Peretti, they all were gone. Uh, they were not in, you know, the office with Dana and stuff. Joe was the only person there. And the story went that in one of the very earliest shows, Monty Cox, the manager of, you know, at the time, Matt Hughes, Jens Pulver, Tim Sylvia, you know, you're talking about at, at one point he had five of the UFC's champions. So Monty Cox was joking around with Joe Silva and said to him, hey, you know, I'll just giving him a hard time, says, I'll just pull all my fighters from the card. And Dana overheard that, and that made an impact on Dana. And Dana said, you can never put somebody in that position again. You can't allow one guy to dominate the whole roster like that in management. You know, now with a 700-person roster, you take Monty's role, and you put four or five people in there, but they're all tied to the company and stuff, and you've actually duplicated the monopoly. But it looks a little more widespread, a little more, you know, in the system out there. But it's just some regional ties. That's, you know, what could be revealed if the lawsuit were expanded and all those emails between management and the UFC, you know, are, are looked at. They may already have been looked at, but are they part of the lawsuit? Are they part of the problem? I think that they could be. And I don't know that we're prepared to add that to the list of, of uh, you know, delinquencies for the UFC. There are people that may have had management ties that can no longer continue to manage, like Monty Cox, for example that were no longer able to continue to manage because they were blocked off from putting their fighters into the UFC. The UFC would no longer consider their guys. You know, now talk about how the UFC chipped away at Monty. Cause I think that's important to kind of the start of this really. Well, you know, Monty at one point, you know, I think he's just published a book and he is definitely the most prolific manager of, from the early days 
um, and a historic figure in the sport that the UFC won't tell you about. You know, he went on to do many things in Japan and Russia and many things like that, you know. Uh, but in the early days, when Dana made that decision uh, based on the joke with Joe Silva, that you cannot have a manager have that much power and not be in that position, he did slowly start to chip away at Monty. The way that worked was, um, this was around the time that the fighter bonuses were, um, you know, the locker room bonuses. Dana would come in and slip you a check, you know? And that would come with a speech where Dana would tell the, the fighters, you know, you earned that, not your manager. It's a bonus. It's not salary, you know? But Monty's contract is Monty's contract. Monty's contract is I get 20% of all earnings. It's as simple as that. He gets 20% of all earnings, so he sees the bonus is he's due 20% of it. I didn't sit well with everybody. Dana found an in that way. Um, Monty told me himself that he had to let Josh Near go as far as representation at one point because Josh just said, you know, no, I, I, I don't see the bonus as yours. I see the bonuses as something I earned extra, and it's not something I'm going to give you 20% for. So Monty couldn't allow the exception, you know, for he's got a, a roster also. So he let Josh Near go. Matt Hughes is an even bigger example because with Matt, you were talking about bigger dollars. But Matt was the first one where, you know, hey, uh, do the math. If you get a million dollar check, that means he was going to give, uh, you know, his manager $200,000 for really doing absolutely nothing. Because it's not like Monty went in there and said, why don't we negotiate these bonuses where, you know, if my fighter does real well and at the end of the day you select him, he gets a bonus and says, it's not like he came up with the idea, put that in there or anything like that. Dana started using the bonus as a secret thing. Now we see why, maybe with an ulterior motive of getting in there, but there's nothing better than getting money. And he went in and, and these bonuses started in the locker room. And then, you know, you're, you'd have to be a lawyer to interpret who's do what there. But that, that was one way to definitely get chip away at Monty. Was the bonuses and and is does Monty and does any manager deserve a percentage of that? So now I don't know how that works with the new guys and stuff, but I'm sure the UFC doesn't get involved at that level. But when they want to get rid of Monty, they let people know. But you know, one thing he was talking about is you have a handful of guys who not only manage you know a large percentage of UFC fighters, each of them, but they also have their own events. You know, now I see that as a conflict of interest. Do you not? Well, not only is it a conflict of interest, but it, it, it lets them cast their net deeper because their events are, are now tiered slightly under the Dana White show and, you know, two tiers below the UFC, right? But now you find a situation where um, if you go into a market that is untapped for the UFC, like, say, South America, you would you be surprised to find out that those certain companies of the UFC have already probably signed eighty percent of the fighters who are going to be on on the UFC and the UFC roster down the line in Latin America, where there really isn't you know they should be far behind. Those people are managed by their own guys, but now it comes in an American company and signs them blind. Just on potential, if they win three in a row, they move to gain the show and they grab their bite. It's a cookie cutter system. So, yeah, that's what's going on. So the three or four groups out there, they, they sign people, get fighters for their show. Obviously, there's a situation there where it's like, you know, it's like, hey, you know, fight on my show cheap and I'll get you in the UFC kind of thing. Does any of that go on? Because then, you know, then you're really talking about creating an unfair advantage and an unfair playing field for, you know, promoters that don't have that same advantage. Now, do you think the promoters, of, I mean, the managers that were kind of brought up in this video, do you think they take a similar cut to what Monty was taking? Or do you think Probably. it's different? Probably. In, that, in their cases, they're corporations, though. You know, so who knows? I don't know. I don't know exactly what that is, but I, but there's no doubt that, uh, you know, 
Iridium is grabbing a bite from somewhere. Maybe the UFC goes so far as to supplement them with money. But th that would be a, an impropriety, as you pointed out. So where does their income come from? It comes from taking a percentage from the fighters. Well, living with they the matchmaker. Living with the matchmaker you. would be an impropriety too. You know. What was that? Living with the matchmaker would be an impropriety too. You know. Yeah, yeah, but but you know, the commissions are very limited. The commissions supposedly were in are in place to oversee some of this stuff, but now we're talking about very complicated stuff. And they're very simplistic, the commissions, especially now once you get out of Vegas, out of California, New York, and the big commissions talk about part-time workers. They don't have time to investigate and look into this stuff. And the commissions were always, you know, to me, boxing was almost at the point where, you know, the gamblers and the extracurricular activities had almost made it gotten it banned. You know, it wasn't the deaths in the ring or anything like that. It was the criminals around it. And the boxing commissions were put in place to prevent some of that. But all they really did, I think, was, you know, bureaucratize the, the, the criminality of it because, you know, none of that ended bad. The, the, the source of all this is the money that it, it gets to be made in betting and in management and in all the extras around here is such a big piece of the pie that nobody has a real handle on how big it is. But like we've mentioned, you know, why does the UFC, why are they doing power slap? Why are they doing BMX races and crap like that? I believe it's because they're going to gamble on it in the future. You know, I think that's the end goal there. And it was that with the UFC was get it, you know, so that the Vegas casinos have it. And once they do that, it's accepted as a bigger sport. Things get in, in the money, the extracurricular money that is going through there, you know. Right. It, it it it's it's high enough that you know people kill for money you know people kill for money people kill to influence money and to try to do that so by allowing gambling and by encouraging gambling you create a little bit of a lawless atmosphere right but getting back to the management part <clears throat> i wanted to kind of ask you about not just the impropriety we we kind of everybody kind of knows that to be the case but by Having a handful of managers that have their own events, what do you think the UFC's kind of like strategy was with that? Yeah, I think it simplifies things. You know, I think it simplifies things. And, you know, I think that they, they did at some point probably go through a vetting process. So there's really, you know, you pick people you like, you know, you have people that you can work with and stuff. So now... Hey, you know, a call from Iridium to Endeavor to sign a fighter and stuff like that. There's probably not a lot of contentious calls on there. You know, the UFC is pretty clear on they don't change their contracts much. And, you know, they don't make, you know, asterisk for this guy. We're going to add this to the contract or, you know, move it, you know, or a special clause for this guy and stuff like that. None of that goes on. So these managers understand that. And again, it, it, it bears to the question of, you know, how much of what the managers are doing is for show and how much do they already know the guys are in the UFC already and they're doing it for show. So the fight. So here's the impropriety. So I get a guy, I find I'm the matchmaker. If I match me the fight, I don't think he can legally take a percentage of that fight salary from the fighter. Because if I match made the fight, that excludes me from being able to take a percentage from either fighter because then there's an impropriety. Hey, I wanted the guy I get a percentage from to win, right? And you have to report that stuff on your taxes. You made money on it. It's got to be on your taxes, right? And be a matchmaker. You got to hand in, you know, your taxes. But again, does the boxing commission actually check this stuff? Who knows? You know, it could all be right in the taxes of these people that they've signed people. They're taking a percentage. They're double dipping and charging the guy less and taking a percentage of his salary, even though you're also the matchmaker. That shouldn't be going on. The commission should assure that's not going on. But now take that. So the fighter does real good under that circumstance. Now they move into Dana's uh, contender show and then the UFC, and then they start grabbing a percentage. And again, you know, some of the, some of the incoming contracts nowadays could be three, four fights, 40 grand. 
10 foot thousand a fight. Or 10,000, 12,000, 14,000, 18,000. So now, you know, on a 20% basis, two, three, five, you multiply that by 300 people that they might have on the roster at this point. And you can see why why it's worth it to have a little company and build it up and stuff. So you're kind of comparing it to like a mafia family where you have your family underneath you that protects you in kind of the same way. Yeah, yeah, I think I think for sure. I think, for example, you know, if a man... <laughs> Yeah, I think it has a similar aspect to that because the bottom line is, is, um, you know, managers that are not in the little click don't get their guys that easily into the UFC, you know, and, and a lot of them, you know, could find that, you know, at certain levels, once you're starting, you know, you're, you're in a gym, you, you've been practicing, you want, you've made your choice to compete. The guys have been training you, you know, if you're fantasizing about a UFC career, maybe your your friend manages you, or maybe the coach is also the guy who got you the fight, so you you know he's going to corner you. So maybe he's also your manager, coach, and things like that. And at some point, if a figure from one of these other entities comes in and and takes over for your manager, takes you know actually you've already got somebody doing that job, but you won't get the fight unless you now turn over those duties to them. See, now that goes on, that's, you know, why can't the other manager accomplish the same thing? What What's so complicated about an entry-level UFC contract? It's just paperwork. So why why funnel people to a specific company? But that goes on all the time. The taking of a young guy who's, you know, managed at a local level and telling him, hey, I'm a Vegas-based manager. It's like, hey, so now some kid with a 4-2 and two record living on the Mexican border says, yeah, I got a manager in Vegas. It's just the same smoke and mirrors thing where uh, it doesn't amount to much, but should you start to blossom, you'll, you'll see those management types be there for you. You know, now you're, you've become an asset that's right. But, but at this point, it almost seems like they're blanket signing people around the globe as much as possible just to sink their hooks in and then see how it plays out. That's not really... You know, the it it's it seems to me the easiest way to handle the roster, to, and and it, it leans on the connections more than actually, you know, just the fighter. Now, another thing that he didn't mention that you kind of wanted that you feel is important in this is uh the antitrust suit and kind of where this whole UFC managers could tie into this. Yeah, like I get. Uh, you know, as the fighters developed this lawsuit, you know, they were like, well, we want to include every fighter, you know, and then the lawyers got involved and now there's like a time frame and a certain amount of fights that you have to have. It still encompasses a hell of a lot of fighters and billions of dollars, right? I think they missed an opportunity to include some of the managers and Monty being one of them. I don't know if Monty would want to play this game of being in court and stuff like that, but I think that Monty's one that um, they read that he had a monopoly, so they actively uh, worked to shut him down. And then that monopoly style of just having all the fighters, you know, signed under certain umbrellas, um, I think they, they sort of copied by having, you know, members of a club being the managers as well now. And, you know, that comes combined with you get a show on Fight Pass and you get, you know, to sit there and, you know, basically like pan for gold, you know, because at the end of the day, what those guys are going to do, you know, when one of them hands in the next, you know, Conor McGregor, you know, everybody's going to make money on down the chain there. And, you know, there's a lot of people that are grabbing money in that pot. And that's probably, you know, the basis of the UFC's lawsuit. The fighters aren't getting enough. And yeah, I think that this that the management and the management system that's in place now has grown to be something that could be looked at in the same way as that lawsuit, that it's a problem. 
Now, let me ask know, you this. You subpoena okay. all the records. The records will tell us right away. Mm -hmm. But, you you know, you hear rumors, you know. Let me ask you this, because we were talking about Monty and how he had a number of guys on the card. I mean, there's managers now that, you know, are in the circle that we're talking about who have a, a number of, you know, champions. Don't they have the same power or no? Yeah, no, I don't think so. I don't think so because I, I, I think at the end of the day, Monty worked for the fighters. But if if you are a manager of guys that are also fighting on your show and you're counting on your show to attract and monetize your show, linchpin is that you're on UFC Fight Pass. You know, if, if you're not on the UFC Fight Pass, then you are really are a, a B or C class, show, like a total, like, you know, you're a local show. You're not anywhere in, you know, you're not in the, there's like a race or a pattern of, you know, you fight on a certain show and then you move into these shows that are on Fight Pass. And once you're there, you know, the, the amateur, then the pro, then the Fight Pass show, then the Dana White show, that's what they want. They want that pattern to be very clear and very easy and cookie cutter. And it, it almost excludes the need for a manager because, they, like I said, I don't believe that these managers are actively saying, you know, well, look, you know, in this particular case, um, we have a special situation. This guy's wife is over there. You know, could we get an extra plane ticket in there? I don't. They're not bothering the UFC with any stuff like that. That's what the UFC wants because that's what managers do is they ask for things. And I don't think these guys, because they're on Fight Pass and stuff like that, they're they're not able to fully represent the fighters because they, you know, if they become too annoying or go against the, the grain, they put that Fight Pass thing on, at risk. For their events. Yeah, for their events. Yeah. But that's a definite event. I mean, if you've done you know, 40 shows, 60 shows, 100 shows, like some of them have at this point, but you come off Fight Pass, you just, you're, you're, your show is taking an immeasurable step back. You know, and that recognition and the fighters that want to be there and stuff like that, that that's the reason fighters want to be there. You know, so yeah, the, the, the fact that they're tied in, you know, I think precludes any ability of them, to, there's no management going on for the fight with the fighters in mind. All they are is a conduit to make the managers, you know, the the fighters more like sheep, and they come in. It's like so any fighter with any weird request, that manager doesn't even have to sign them. You know, that's not. He's going to be difficult. I won't. I, I, I'm not getting involved in that. But they know up front. Look, this is what you get. You get ten and ten. Yeah, and that's another way that they can keep other managers that are trying to get into the game out. Yeah, and you can you can ask the me start. this too. Even in a situation where, like, you're on the Dana White Contender Series, maybe you know Dana's not sure about issuing you a contract. He doesn't issue you a contract. Is that manager actually actively calling? You know, one FC, the PFL, uh, you know, whatever other organizations are there. You know, organizations in Poland and Russia, you know, I know that times have changed politically, but you could find fights for people. You know, if you were a veteran of the UFC, you can get fights and go and face a tough up and coming guy almost anywhere in the world. But are these managers actively looking for those fighters? No. That are not there yet? No. I, I think you're sort of on your own. And then, like, if you hit the radar, then you hit the radar and they put you into the Funnel that leads up to the UFC. I got to win two more. How many, uh, is it, how many people have heard from a guy? I got to win two more. I got to win one more to get into Dana White show or to get into the UFC. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're offering. They're not offering them. I'll negotiate you the best deal possible. Everybody gets the same thing. So what about one kid who's actually, you know, done all the things, maybe gotten his social media bumped up higher than most, and, you know, this, that, or the other stuff. Can he get an extra 15, you know, five grand? To, can I ask for any of that? No, they just go out and sign somebody else. Mm -hmm. At that point, they, they they don't have enough juice for anything. So the, those managers are, are, are pawns in a the game. They don't 
really negotiate for the fighters. They take a, a standard contract, get the guy's signature, email it, and then forward it. It's they're, they're, that's what people are paying a percentage of their salaries for. Right. Yeah, that'll be interesting because I know there's, I forgot the guy's name, but it'll be interesting to see how he can, because he's not in one of these circles, I don't think, but he was on Ariel Hawani's show. I can't remember who he was exactly. But, you know, if you're not in the circle, it would probably be hard to have any success. But he is managing some UFC fighters, so who knows? <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, there are some guys that have been on the roster for a long time, and this system has been evolving now. You know, they've gotten the, the fight pass stuff. They've been organized now for years. But, you know, in the original, it was like, what are they showing? Who, what shows are on there? Who's that? You know, so all that's been developing. There are fighters on the roster from that era. You know, so they have to they have to deal with some people. But I think more and more people at the lowest level are being, you know, the thing is, is when you, when you're talking to a kid four and two, you know, 10 years ago, and I don't know if this is right or wrong. Yeah. I, 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 I do know this is correct rather. I don't know if this is, you know, good or bad for the fighter, but you didn't get a four and two guy telling you talk to my Vegas based manager. You know, you didn't get a two and O guy talking to you about like, you know, I, I, you know, I got a guy, this guy's over here promising the US, to be the UFC in three more fights. And now you do. You know, so, but but I, I argue that still that's not, you know, getting into the UFC faster, like I said, makes it easier for them to get their hooks in. But I, I argue that there's no real negotiation or man, real management going on there other than the shuffling of paperwork. Not management in terms of guiding your career and trying to get you the most money for your next fight. Because they're just mass signing guys. Like when you have 300, 400, 500 people in your agency yeah, that are, you know, fighters, there's no way you're trying to get the best deal for all of them. So let, let's, let's take a look at this kid that fought Bo Nickel. Right. Seven and up, right? So, not everybody's Bo Nickel. I think we've already seen that Bo Nickel is like a blue chip type of prospect, right? Right. He, he like he's being handled that way, and he's checked off a lot of boxes that he is without a lot of missteps. So he's looking like the real deal, right? So you don't take a seven and zero kid off of the B circuit and rush him into that fight. You know that that may have been a good example of where a manager should have said, "Not today, not this one." Not Bo Nickel. I'll, we'll do. We'll do you a favor and somebody else, but that's not a good fight for us. Apparently, he got a four fight contract out of it. So it's like it, that's the sad part. I think today is guys are like, "Well, I got a contract out of it." Well, yeah, but you got, you know, yeah. So you got four fights at what? Yeah. Starting at ten grand. Maybe they gave you twenty grand. You know, again, you're talking about insignificant. It may seem like a lot of money if you were fighting for five hundred or thousand dollars, and you're a young person. And this is your first break. Hey, I'm going to go to the UFC for a $20,000 thing. But again, uh, the four fight contract could be a thing where it's like, uh, you know, they probably won't cut him after the bone nickel loss, but may, one more loss and they, you could be yep. cut. That's right. You know, and, um, you know, it's not, it's not like that, that those contracts are for that huge money. And you're very susceptible to them already you know you didn't it's like it would have been great if you could come out and do something with Bo stretch him to the second round put him on queer street for a minute but you didn't do anything like that mm -hmm. so what you know what if, if hey look you know now we got your second fight coming up we're going to stick him in with Kelvin Gastel you know a, a veteran who's far far ahead of the curve of where he is also right. and then you're done that's it you're, ne you're never coming back again yep I, I, you are you so your manager should be considering all of that there should be a conversation that are are ha being had by teams and things 
And, you know, at the highest level, like, you know, was it John Jones who refused to fight Chael Sonnen? Because he still has the power to, right? right. You know, I don't want to do something with an X factor. Like, at the last minute, anything can go wrong. No, that's stupid for me. John Jones is able to do that. Why wasn't this kid here at 7-0 and go, you know, why can't you just offer me the Dana White contract I've been waiting for at 7-0? and why you got to rush me in there, you know, or now you bump me up, you give me some money and stuff. Can't, why can't now? Yeah, he, he, I, I don't, I, I think he thought it was a good idea to say yes. And I don't think it is. And I don't think is. I, I, I bet you his manager was telling him what a great job he did getting him this opportunity as, as opposed to them really having the conversation. If the kid wanted to do it, by all means do it. You know, it's almost better to come up through the, the contender series or something and fight on the low end. I mean, cause like you said, if you go in there and you lose to Bo Nick on a pay-per-view, a fairly big pay-per-view also, you know, their biggest pay-per-view of the year. And then what do they do with you after that? You know what I mean? They... It's a killer roster. You're, you're yeah. in over your head already. You're doing them a favor. So you think that there's a, they'll may, they might scratch your back. But they already did. That came in the form of a four-fight deal, which we've already described could could go very wrong for you. That that kid was put. That kid probably shouldn't have taken that fight. They probably should have backed off, come back with Nickel in three weeks, and made a, a, a attempted to make a, a fight with somebody on the roster who was, you know, nobody wants to fight this guy, et cetera, et cetera. It's like okay, I understand that. Less that's going to happen on you know a week's notice. So, but they chose to piece it together, and all uh, my point is is that who's managing that kid, and did that manager present this to him as like I got you in the UFC, I'm great for sure, or for sure. did they say to him, look, this is something we got to think about, but I don't know, you know, if you have, if he's got potential, then they really should have thought about what they're doing to maybe nip his potential in the bud with this fight. If this is this is one that could have. Other people turned it down, so. Yeah, and I mean, it's not like they're going to, it'll be interesting to see who they put him in with next, like you said. You know, will they put him in with another guy who has less than 10 fights like him? Or are they going to put him in with a veteran fighter who's likely to just be way more skilled, way more experienced, and that'll be it after he loses that guy? Yeah, and and... You know, despite the fact that the UFC, you know, has a show every week and, you know, we could probably name the main fights on the next 10 shows already signed and out there in public and stuff like that. They don't really do well two, three fights down the line when they promise to build somebody up and things like that. You know, and when things go wrong over and over again, you see them discard people, you know, from, you know, going back to like the Sage Northcutt days when, you know, when Sage didn't continue you know, streaming upwards and he took a bump in the road, they, they, the love fell off. We're watching maybe that same happen to that 17-year-old kid too, you know? Yeah, it's yeah. You know, Because guys with seven fights shouldn't be in the UFC. At least that's the model that they come from. Now they're there, you know, you do have to have a roster that's appropriate so that they're not plugged in with a bunch of guys, but there's so many guys above that still but, but but this is what happens, I think, is the UFC calls the manager. He's like, yeah, you know, what do you got? What do you got for me? Bo Nickel needs an opponent this weekend. And this, the, what these companies will now do is not like they, you know, man, I got, I got, I don't got a guy. I'm sorry. Call the next guy. The next guy. All right. I got a guy that's in the perfect weight class. We got a guy who's been looking for an opportunity. We'll take it. You know, that's not what's going on here. They call one guy and the guy goes, Here's my list, 14 dudes in that weight class, chit, 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 until they pick one. And that's not a natural management system that's working for the fighters. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And also, you know, uh, the other guy you were talking about, the young guy, because he's kind of, we'll Russell. see what they do with him next. Yeah, but, you know, uh, yeah. you you already, you know, Compared to the hype train he was on, you know, you've already, I think, seen him get discarded. 
you know, because there hasn't been like a follow up, like, or let's check in on him. How's he doing? Or it hasn't been anything. It's just, it's, he's back on the roster down there somewhere. And Dean doesn't give a shit about him anymore. You know? So, yeah, I, I think that's the atmosphere we're working in here, boys and girls. I think it's uh, a situation where the management structure of this sport is also questionable um, and collusive in preventing the fighters from getting all their worth and preventing other management companies except for the you know chosen ones from you, you know competing in the business and things i think there are other you know those aspects could be looked at here i don't know what they'll find either you know proof wise but i do think that the questions could be asked it's very very um circumstantial evidence is very wide well, Miguel, as always, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. And I, I think we can do some more, you know, maybe find some videos that people have done and kind of, you know, elaborate on them a little bit. I think it's interesting. And uh, again, I appreciate MMAI for providing that. It was a great, you know, I think the guy did a great job. He does a great job on his video. And uh, tell people what you're doing. Me? <laughs> Well, I uh, we're doing the MMA Museum podcast over at MMA Collector 74 uh, on YouTube. It's uh, the MMA Museum podcast. We're just doing interviews, career interviews. And then um, I've been working for a dog rescue down in Costa Rica. And um, that's kind of been consuming a lot of my time. And it's um, a lot of fun, very rewarding. And, uh, you know, uh, I haven't gotten bit yet. So I'm still pretty, pretty happy with, with uh, the new job there. Yeah, should we, we should put something down like for people who maybe want to contribute to the dog rescue or something. Hey, you know, we could always use it. I mean, the bottom line is is these guys, right now we've got a couple of pit bulls that have been, we rescued uh, years ago, really, that, um, you know, we, we're paying for training for them. You know, and until they get trained properly, um, you know, they're just going to be sitting there. So in order to get people adoptable and things like that, there's a lot of work to be done. So yeah, if anybody, I'll send you a link if you want to put it up there. If anybody wants to throw you yeah, five yeah, bucks on, that. on a Patreon, um, you know, we got things like that. Or uh, I think there's a GoFundMe that that's out there that, uh, you know, would be great, uh, greatly appreciated. Thanks. Yeah. I think it'd be a great cause. Yeah, that's for sure. All right. So Miguel, like I said, it's always a great talking with you and getting your insights. And uh, for everyone that supports these shows, the MMA Conspiracy Hour and the other shows, you know, I appreciate it a lot. And uh, until next time, keep an eye out and uh, take it easy. <laughs>